In this chapter, we're going to be exploring two types of functions, polynomial functions and rational functions. So let's start by talking about polynomial functions. And I've given you the general form for a polynomial function here. We say let n be a non-negative integer. And we see this general form here. And I know it looks a little complicated at first, but really just to break it down, here's the main thing that we need to know. With a polynomial function, we are mainly looking at the degrees. And we say that degrees here have to be non-negative integers. Well, let's think about that for a second. We say that they have to be non-negative because if they were if they were negative, then we could start looking at um, ra rational functions. Or, for example, if we said something like x to the negative 1, that would be equivalent to 1 over x. So now we're looking at rational functions. Next, we'd also have to say that these have to be integers, because if they were not an integer, like something like 1 half, now we're looking at radical functions. So polynomial functions are ones in which every term consists of a degree that is a non-negative integer. And this can also include constants, uh, such as where the degree is 0, something like x to the 0 power, which is just some constant. So that's how we're going to define polynomial functions. And for the most part, we're going to look at polynomial functions in this course, uh, where the coefficients are uh, integer coefficients, although not always, uh, and then mostly real coefficients, so not including real numbers. Important things to know about um, polynomial functions in this course is that the domain of a polynomial function will be all real numbers. We can effectively plug in any number into our polynomial function and get a valid output. Now graphically some things that we should know about polynomial functions is that they are going to be continuous, continuous with no sharp turns. And the reason why that second part is important, because oftentimes if there is a sharp turn, there's something going on there that makes it a not a polynomial function. So let me give you some quick examples. So take a look at some of these graphs that I've just sketched here. Looking at that first one, we see that this is a continuous function that doesn't have any sharp turns. So we would say that, yes, this appears to be a polynomial function. Well, what about this next one here? This next graph has no sharp turns, but it's not a continuous function, so this one would not be a polynomial function. What about this one here? Something that might have, like, for example, a vertical asymptote here. Again, no sharp turns. That's great, but again, not continuous, so this would not be a polynomial function. And then this last one here, which looks like an absolute value graph, it is continuous, but we've got this sharp turn here, which would make it a absolute value function in all likelihood. So we would say, no, this one is not a po polynomial function. Okay. Now, oftentimes when we're looking at the polynomial function, we will want to look at the degree and then its leading coefficient. So when we say this, we're saying that when our degree is odd, when n, our leading degree is odd, we then look at our leading coefficient, which if you go back to our general form, is the first term or the first coefficient that goes with the first term. We say that when our n, or our leading degree, is odd, and our leading coefficient is positive, then we see that one end of the graph is going to fall, and the other end of the graph is going to rise. When a is negative, then the graph is going to go in opposite directions, where the left end is going to rise, and the right end is going to fall. Bottom line, when your degree is odd, then both ends of the graph are going to go in opposite directions. Now, which one falls and which one rises? That effectively means you have to look at your leading coefficient. Now, you may have had different ways of describing this type of end behavior in the past. Uh, something you might say is as x, oh, excuse me, as x approaches, in this case, negative infinity, f of x approaches positive, uh, excuse me, negative infinity. And then you would say on those lines, as x approaches, if I can just pretty much take this whole statement here, oops, copy and paste it here, as x approaches this time positive infinity, then f of x also approaches positive infinity. That's one way of describing it, and that's actually a great way of describing it, something that will be really useful when you start talking about limits and end behavior and limits at infinity in calculus. Uh, for the intents of our course, we can just say that the left end is going to fall and the right end rises. That's a bit more informal, but I would accept that on um, in this course. Well, now let's look at what happens when our degree n is even. 
Main thing to remember is that when your degree is even, that both ends of the graph are going to go in the same direction. When your leading coefficient is positive, both ends are going to rise. Both ends are going to fall when our leading coefficient is negative. So to put it all together, when, degree, when your degree is odd, the graph is going to go in opposite directions. When your degree is even, your graph is going to go in the same direction. How exactly does that happen? Well, that will de then depend on your leading coefficient. So to really explore this, I've given you some graphs here that I'd like you to pause and try to work through on your own. Um, take out a graphing calculator or even just pull up a graphing utility like Desmos and just put, put these in. And before you do, I want you to kind of predict what you think is going to happen with your leading coefficient. So for the intent of this video lesson, I'm just going to look at this first one here. Pause the video right now and ask yourself, what do I know about this graph or this function's degree? and its leading coefficient. And based on that, can I predict which way the end behavior will work? Well, if you've had a chance to work through it, I just want to pull up the graph real quick here, if I can listen to me. And there you go. That graph should look like this. And if you predicted that this graph is going to have uh, end behavior that goes in opposite directions, you'd be correct, because your degree was odd. And your leading coefficient, in this case, was positive 1. Therefore, your right end is going to rise, and your left end is going to fall or we would say as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity, and as, as x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity also. Okay, so let me go ahead and put that away. Now with that said, let's look at a problem where we want to find the zeros of a polynomial function. If you want to pause to write down these steps here, uh, you're welcome to do so right now. Important things to know is that when we are finding a polynomial function of zeros, the value where x is equal to, that causes the function to be equal to zero, we're going to say x is equal to a. This has many names. We can call it a zero. We can call it a root. We can also call it a solution. But the main thing to understand is these are the values that cause our function to be equal to zero. We want to distinguish that between an x-intercept, however. Let me do this in a different color. An x-intercept, however, is a coordinate. It is the coordinate or the ordered pair that represents where the function is crossing the x-axis. And then finally, we would say our factor, let me actually do this in a different color, our factor is the, the binomial that includes that solution or zero. So we always say x minus whatever your root is. So let's take a moment and let's find all the real zeros of this particular function here, okay? So Finding the zeros is pretty straightforward at this point. All we need to do is set our function equal to zero. So zero is equal to x to the fifth minus 6x cubed plus 9x. And we can just solve this algebraically. If we can see here, we can we have a common factor of x in all of these terms, which we'll factor out. So we're left with x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 9. And now we have a quartic that we can actually solve like a quadratic. So we're going to say x squared minus 3 times x squared minus 3. And on this note, we will then say, all right, well, let me actually go back. Our zeros are as follows. x could be equal to 0. It's also equal to, if I were to set x squared minus 3 equal to 0, x squared is equal to positive 3. So x is equal to plus or minus root 3. So we're going to say plus or minus root 3. Those are the zeros from this factor. But we also see that that plus or minus root 3 also appears here. So we can say plus or minus root 3 again. So count them up. And we're going to talk about this more when we talk about uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra. But understanding that since our degree is 5, we can have up to 5 real zeros. And we see here that we indeed have 5 zeros here. 0, positive root 3, negative root 3, another positive root 3, and another negative root 3. Now, another way of expressing this is to say the following. 0, positive and negative root 3, and each of these with a multiplicity, we'll say multiplicity of 2. Well, what are we referring to in multiplicity? It's just a way of saying that that 0 appears more than once. So we're saying that positive root 3 appears twice, so it has a multiplicity of 2, and negative root 3 appears twice, also saying that we have a multiplicity of 2. Moving forward, this is how we should be expressing our zeros of our polynomial functions. And this is important because that has implications on how the graph looks, which we'll discuss in the next lesson.
But for now, just know that that's how we would find the real zeros. Now, there may be cases where you may not be able to factor that function. So let's take a look at this example here. If you're looking at it, we may not have the tools just yet to be able to factor something like this, but we could also graph this as well. So let me just really quickly pull this up. Let me go ahead and graph something like this. So we'll just put in the terms. We're going to say x to the fifth minus x to the third plus x squared minus 6x minus 3. And if I pull that down here, you can see the graph. And this allows me to find the zeros pretty quickly, right? Looks like they're all rounded, but we can find the three zeros there. Now, what if we're not graphing? Well, in which case, we may need to refer to something called the rational roots theorem, which again, we'll talk about in uh, another lesson. But stay tuned, and we will definitely discuss how to break down a function such as this that may not be easily factorable at first glance. In the meantime, just understand that we can set our functions equal to zero, and if it is possible to algebraically solve, we would state the zeros and discuss any possible multiplicity. If we can't do that, then we have really no choice at this point other than to try and graph. And I've already discussed multiplicity, so I've written it out here. But just to recap, if I want to solve and find all possible zeros, I would set it equal to zero. So in this case, I'm going to start to solve this. And we would say that 0 is equal to x squared times x minus 5 times x plus 4. x then is equal to 0 with a multiplicity, and I'm just going to abbreviate it here, of 2. So we've got two instances of that 0, a positive 5 and negative 4. These are the four zeros of this function here. Now, as a follow-up, ask yourself, okay, well, based on my leading coefficient and my degree, what can I predict about the end behavior of this function? Take a moment and think about that. And correct. You would, you would be correct if you said that both ends of the graph are going to be opening up because their degree was even, they're both opening in the same direction, and our leading coefficient was positive 1. Therefore, they are both going to be opening up in this case. And in the next video, we will be talking about how to find uh, more zeros of functions uh, and also actually how to start graphing and putting it all together.